the geographical midpoint of Europe. If you could make a physical copy of a geometric figure of Europe, it can be balanced on a needle placed at this point. Ah, so it seems to be a little bit more east than you'd expect, but it's to be able to balance out everything. Western Europe doesn't have a whole lot of land this way. I don't think Iceland's weighing it down too much over here either. And then you have big, thick Russia with a ton of territory. I'm just really excited you've included Kazakhstan in Europe, confirming that this nation is actually European, whether you like it or not. I love it. This also looks like an alternative history map of what if Bangladesh Bangladesh took over all of the European continent. Now it's just actually showing their territorial gains. This is the proposed Salwal Canal, which would turn Qatar into the 50th island nation in the world. It'd be 60 kilometers long, 200 meters wide, and 15 to 20 meters deep. It actually doesn't seem all that deep at all. Keep in mind the world's largest canal by length is in China, and it goes over a thousand miles. Then there's one of the most famous examples, the Suez Canal. This is over a hundred kilometers in length. Actually almost 200 if you round it a little bit up. Even the Panama is only 82 kilometers, so technically Qatar is not trying to do anything super crazy with 60. The only issue here is though... Why? It's gonna cost like, what, 500 billion if not a trillion dollars? Like, I don't understand. Is it really that bad going from Abab to Doha? You don't like to go north? You'd just rather go out this way or something? Turns out this was all some sort of prank by Saudi Arabia. They wanted to turn Qatar into an island when the two countries had a falling out. I guess they were hoping after building the canal, Qatar would just kind of float away. The range of the Siberian tiger from the 19th century to modern day. I didn't even have to look at this map. I knew by just hearing that phrase, it was gonna be depressing. These things are so epic looking too. So back in the 1800s, these tigers roamed all the way from South Korea way up to like Manchurian lands and modern day Russian lands. They were kind of just surrounding this river right here. But obviously since then, things have really shrank to just pretty much Russian lands only. There's a couple spots in China where they still exist. But it's really on this tip of Russia where like nobody really lives. Well, people do live down there, but the more north you go, it gets pretty green. Here's just a comparison of the distribution of all tiger subspecies between 1900 and 1990, tigers pretty much do not exist in China. When they used to roam all throughout these lands, they still have a very strong hold over Lao though, that's for sure. And then sadly, none of the tiger subspecies even exist in Central Asia anymore. They're completely gone. According to National Geographic, only about 50 wild Siberian tigers remain in Russia and China today. These are actually among one of the most endangered carnivores on Earth. Oh man, now I'm depressed. There has been attempts at a species recovery over the years, and they are projected it to return a little bit. I guess we can only hope, although I don't think their range is going to go back down to Korea again. These are the proposed borders by Count Aranda in 1782. This was made somewhere near the end of the Revolutionary War for the U.S. So keep in mind we were looking more like this while we were at war with Great Britain for our independence. So they allowed the U.S. to get a little bit further inside of the continent, but it would be nowhere near the new Spanish territorial gains. They also were going to allow British America to exist over here, or in other words, Canada. All this light blue would be given to Spain claims on the Illinois country. Of course, they had Florida at this time. I'm sure they wanted to connect to those borders. So looking at this territorial evolution map of North America, in 1783, this is what our borders somewhat look like. So this is a year later from the Count's proposal. I think another thing to keep in mind during like American colonial history, a lot of this stuff wasn't set in stone. You just had like random settlers going out into the forest figuring, ah, I guess I'll build a house here. But yeah, so Spain was really trying to get as much of this stuff as possible before the U.S. came in. Although the Count's proposal was really not taking into account the French territory out here, which America was also going to purchase that one day. I wonder if this actually did happen. Would it have just led to like a massive Mexico independence? Some mega Mexico. The optimum conditions for human society to flourish. All the areas in green have a mean annual temperature between 11 degrees Celsius or 15 degrees Celsius. That's 51 to 59, which actually seems a little bit cold, but that's a mean annual temperature. So it probably doesn't. That's just like around the coldest is gonna get, it's not gonna get too, too bad. So as you can see, there is a straight strip right through the United States. There's also a nice pocket of it here in Argentina, a little bit in South Africa, a little bit in Australia. Pretty much, this is interesting because it's literally the only part of Australia where people really live. They really aren't kidding. This is the optimal place for humans to flourish, at least on this continent. And then notice the huge strip that goes straight through Eurasia as well. Also, there's a lot of people here. This is where a large portion of humans live. So now we're gonna compare this current map to what it's gonna look like possibly 
a hundred years into the future. As temperatures increase globally, the strip in North America goes way more north. Even Canada gets to benefit from it in some parts. There seems to be a little bit more livability out here in the Andes Mountains in South America. And the pocket in Argentina actually shifts downward. Africa almost no longer falls into this optimal area or temperatures for humans to flourish in. Europe looks about the same, except it does look like it's extended its range as well. Even Sweden gets some of it. The strip continues to go out through China, but it's mostly a connected strip to North Korea. Optimal place to live, boys. I always knew it. Australia is even worse off than before, but New Zealand's really enjoying these changes. So obviously there is more green, and the green shifts more northward or even southward, although most of the southern stuff really just kind of disappears. Of course, temperature alone does not dictate where humans can really flourish. There's a lot of other factors. This is just something to keep in mind. Chat GPT search interest worldwide. Now, I've definitely noticed the surge in interest with chat GPT. I've made a couple gaming slash mapping videos on my second channel. Those videos are doing really good. Everyone seems to really like those. I mean, you can see from this line graph alone, it was virtually dead in November. Then there's a big spike in December. Then another resurgence happens around the middle of January, which I find kind of funny since that's a time when a lot of kids go back to school. I wonder what students are using chat GPT for. Now, interestingly, the number one place that's showing interest in this new advanced AI is China. They seem to be doing the most searches about it, looking it up, trying to figure it out. Then it's Nepal and Singapore. I really didn't expect those two places. USA is only 29th on the list. Meanwhile, Canada is 7th. UK and France don't care about it all too much either, but here they are. Norway seems to really like it here in Europe. Again, if you don't know what ChatGPT is, it's like really advanced AI that'll write like entire essays for you if you give it the right prompt. I have a weird feeling this is only going to become more and more popular as we head into 2023. Residence requirements for naturalization in Europe, or basically the duration of legal residence before a national of foreign state can request citizenship under that state's naturalization laws. This also has nothing to do with marriage if you just want to be a natural citizen by living there. So in Russia, you have to live there for five years to be a natural citizen, and that goes for a lot of countries in Western Europe, UK, Ireland, France. These places in the south, though, make it a lot harder. In Spain, it's 10 years, and in the micronation of Andorra, it's 20. In San Marino, it's 30. That seems a little bit crazy when I can just like fly to Serbia right now and become a Serbian in three years. I think I actually might do that real quick. Fly to Serbia three years, fly to Armenia for three years, fly to Israel for three years, and become like a quadro citizen. Is that what that's called? That is a very oddly specific number there, Denmark. Now, I'm sure there's more to this than just these straight up numbers. There's probably a lot more of a process that has to happen. There's probably also several geopolitical and historical reasons for all these numbers too. There's loopholes as well, like in Spain, if you're Filipino or from Latin America, it's reduced from 10 to 2. The actual difficult part here is getting legal residence in this country in the first place, though. Like, if you get that, then these numbers are possible, but you gotta get that first, and that could be difficult. Look at Jordan here with 15 years. I almost forgot that. The pronunciation of the word arm in English. So I guess over time, the R in arm has been pronounced less and less. Arm, um, I think is what sometimes they say. Me arm. Um. So the southern part of the country, like Cornwall and south of London, even like next to their territory of Wales, they were definitely saying arm. There was little pockets that were saying arm as well, but this dark green was only going to expand as we head on into 2023. There are still holdouts though in Cornwall, and they're still saying arm. But over the last 73 years, I guess it has just become, um, I guess we here in the US are heading in the opposite direction. We're saying too much of the R. Arm. Is this the one example where in the US we are speaking it more correctly? I even allowed to say that? Another good example of this is car and ka, mi ka. Here are some of the confirmed, unconfirmed, and to be confirmed modern Western battle tanks given to Ukraine. So we have 14 Challenger 2s from Great Britain, as well as the USA promising M1 Abrams. There's 31 of those. 14 Leopard 2 tanks coming from both Germany and Poland. Oh, they don't have the exact same number. Wait, so did the UK. Now there's a ton of unconfirmed Spanish tanks that we're still trying to figure out. There's up to 53. When did Spain become a tank industrial powerhouse. There's eight from Norway that are also unconfirmed as well. Then we have Sweden, the Netherlands, Finland, and Denmark. These are all to be confirmed. We have 14, uh, 10, and 6. These are main battle tanks, by the way. Ukraine desperately needs tanks to keep up with the Russian tanks because they kind of have a whole lot of those, at least like over 10,000. Ukraine has a good amount too, but nowhere compared to this. Poland just really with a ton over a thousand. I don't know if Turkey's willing to give up 
up their tanks just yet. California's GDP versus select countries. So here in my home state of California, we have a GDP of 3.36 trillion as with our 39 million population, which that has been kind of slowing over the, we were closer to 40 million not that long ago, versus the combined countries of Czechia, Romania, Finland, Colombia, Chile, Pakistan, Iran, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Malaysia. With that, all those countries combined have 653 million population. That is quite the statistic for sure. To be fair, Hong Kong is a very tiny place. The fact they're making almost 400 billion is pretty incredible. However, one place that punches way above us with less population and less land is Switzerland. They have 800 billion, and that's all with only 8.7 million people. That's a quarter of what California has. Austria, right next to Switzerland, also huge amount of money. Poland beating us as well. Everything's always about a perspective. I just spent the past 15 months walking every walkable street in Long Beach, California. Here's my day-to-day -day progress towards completion. Now, as someone who pretty much grew up in Long Beach, California, this is the most insane thing to me. I mean, first of all, it is just a pretty insane task, but because I know Long Beach, I'm just in shock at your courage here. Some of those streets, man, some of those streets, it gets scary. And he went to every segment, every day, he was getting off different zones. Interesting how in January he got this segment. I'm assuming once he finished this, he's like, well, I think I could do all of Long Beach by March. And some of those areas are pretty nice to be walking down right here. It's nice. The thing is, Long Beach also has a lot of like really small streets. I mean, uh, there are parts of LA that are like that too, but that definitely made this a lot more difficult. I could never do this. The ship logs of several European countries between the years 1700 and 1850. So this is going to be really interesting to look at because we can kind of figure out why certain countries are going the places they're going. For instance, the British here for at least the first half of this date range was going to the 13 colonies. They were also making quick stops to a couple islands in the Caribbean they owned. Of course, there was their spot in South Africa they had, and then they were definitely starting to really explore India, but that was probably more towards the later half of this date range, the late part of the 1850s. There's the French, who were just mainly flowing straight into Canada, or probably their Quebec. They too also had some holdings in the Caribbean. I'm surprised they weren't going to Louisiana. They weren't really going anywhere else either. Again, this is till 1850. They didn't have Southeast Asia. They didn't own Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos yet. There's these Spanish ship logs, which were mostly going straight to Florida, and of course the Caribbean. They owned Cuba at this time. They were going to Mexico, but their favorite Latin American colony, it looks like, was Argentina. Probably a lot easier to get there. They had to move around Portuguese Brazil, although maybe they were touching it a little bit. They tried their best to go up around to reach their other Spanish colonies, like I guess they stopped by Peru. And of course, this line out this way is showing they would go to the Philippines. There was the, uh, what was that, Armanda? There was a huge ship that, uh, like, had a bunch of gold, Spanish gold, that they were they pick up from their colonies. But for the most part, they didn't have a lot of other things in the Eastern Hemisphere. Finally, there's the Dutch ship log, which immediately I'm like, why were they going so far up north? They were just exploring up there or what? They of course had a couple of experiments with like Dutch Brazil for a second, but they were mainly really obsessed with a place called Indonesia or the Dutch East Indies. They were going to make a big old company out of that. And also famously, the Dutch were the only people allowed to trade with the Japan for several centuries. And unfortunately, Portugal was left off the list, although I think it would just be a straight line to Brazil, to be honest. And here are all the countries combined. So it's the British that are really helping with like the Europeans on this part of the world, but definitely all the Europeans were in the Atlantic Ocean just everywhere. Something else I'm thinking about is these are the ship logs. But what about the stuff that wasn't logged? We want to know about that. And big thanks to my patrons. Drew, I forgot to kidnap you. Next date is March 19th, 2023. The Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Taylor. Portugal John is Denver. not Balkans. Good old Ryan. 244, AKA Barbados Drew, if you don't come to crack out Poland, I will find you. $20 is a lot Drew. Why am I Taylor doing this? Taylor Carroll S. And Savings Gold. Jack Traven's annoying friends. Robert Ryan. The Pie. The Great Sam 